Welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home Reimagining Resilience, presented by TD Bank Group. I'm Jennifer Hollett, and I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we're really excited to be joining you this evening online, connecting people across this country and beyond in conversation. We'll start by acknowledging the land that we're on as part of our larger conversation on resilience, community, and survival. The land is not neutral. There is history and colonization. And a land acknowledgement helps us recognize where the story starts, what happened in the past, thinking about how it informs where we are now and what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. I'm in downtown Toronto, Ontario, Canada, to Toronto. This is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We're honored to carry on a long tradition of storytelling and encourage you to take a moment wherever you're joining us from to reflect on the land that you're on, its history, and the ongoing work of truth and reconciliation. As part of that commitment to reconciliation, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A bit about the walrus. The walrus started 18 years ago really as an optimistic project to tell the stories of Canada and to foster conversation. And we do this in a number of different ways through our journalism, which is available in print, but also online daily at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, and in our public event series like this one, The Walrus Talks, which in the pandemic is The Walrus Talks at Home, My Home and Your Home. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you all for being here and being a part of it. And special thanks to TD Bank Group, who has supported the Walrus Now for over a decade, making this event possible. To kick off this conversation tonight, please welcome TD Bank Group's Senior Manager of Philanthropy and Social Impact, Farah Kurji. Welcome, Farah. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Farah Kurji. I'm the Senior Manager for Canadian Philanthropy at TD Bank Group. I'm proud to be here on behalf of TD for part two of the Walrus Talks at Home, Reimagining Resilience. We are pleased to have supported the Walrus for a number of years and the Walrus Talk specifically since 2018 to provoke new thinking and spark dialogue on a range of matters vital to Canadians. A special thank you to the Walrus for continuing important conversations such as tonight's with the aim of building an informed society and a more inclusive and equitable tomorrow. Helping create the conditions that everyone needs to succeed and fully participate in the changing world is a responsibility we take to heart at TD. Over the past 18 months, we have all had to be resilient and adapt to the impacts of a global pandemic on our daily lives but equity deserving communities have been disproportionately affected and the pandemic has heightened longstanding and systemic inequities prevalent in all aspects of society. Decades of historical exclusion have contributed to this crisis in a crisis where restrictions, public health measures and the prevalence of the disease are not being experienced equally. It will take the active, intentional and consistent effort of all of us in the months ahead and even in the years ahead to address these root issues, to drive systemic change and shape a more inclusive and equitable world. This evening's conversation is a step on that path. The Walrus has invited an impressive panel of experts who will enrich our understanding of resiliency and the underlying barriers faced by equity deserving communities. I'm looking forward to hearing their perspectives and the important discussion that is sure to follow. Please enjoy the event. Thank you and back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Farah, great to see you. The conversation around resilience is extremely relevant these days. We're now more than a year and a half, a long year and a half into COVID-19 and it has changed everything, including us. From students to attending school, uh, and their social lives digitally, to working at home and realistically living at work, to even finding that last drop of hand sanitizer at the grocery store. What the pandemic has really revealed more than ever before 
are the cracks and disparities in society. It should come as no surprise that some of us were better equipped to handle this upheaval. But why were some of us better equipped? Well, socioeconomics has something to do with it, as does policy, racism, gender norms, among a whole long list of reasons. Tonight's live discussion is a second part of the Walrus Talks at Home on this topic, and we're pushing it further. Our speakers will be delving into how resilience can both be helpful, of course, but also harmful. Here's how the event works. Each speaker has five minutes. And then once your head is full of new ideas, we'll have a moderated Q&A session with our talkers and you, the audience at home. If you have a question at any point, you can just type it in the Zoom chat box and ask it. Tonight, we'll be hearing from live Sean Lee, Director of Programming, Tangled Art and Disability, Alison Chedford, Business Consultant and Author, Dr. Roberta K. Timothy, Associate Professor, Black Health Lead, and Inaugural Program Director for the upcoming MPH Program in Black Health, Galolana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and Anne Spice, Assistant Professor at X University. Thank you all for joining us. I'm really looking forward to hearing each of you speak. And we'll kick things off tonight with Sean Lee. Sean, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Hi, my name is Sean Lee, and I'm the Director of Programming at Tangled Art and Disability, based in Tecoronto on Treaty 13 territory. I want to start off with an image description of myself. I'm someone male presenting, and I use he or they pronouns. I'm an East Asian Chinese person with light skin, and I'm someone visibly disabled. My back curves and my shoulders are uneven, and if we met in real life, uh, you'd notice I'm quite short. I have long-ish black hair that goes down below my shoulders. Uh, and I wear these like steampunk glasses that are green with gold rims that float on the frames. Um, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt that says the future is accessible. I'm in my living room and there's some paintings and some leaves behind me. And before I begin, I want to unpack the introduction I just gave a little bit, as a lot of people are still unfamiliar with what a self description is. This is a practice that many disabled people enact when gathering together digitally uh, on platforms like Zoom or when we get together physically. I think we do this as a way of mitigating the normative assumptions of who is present, participating, and leading in these spaces. Self description being just one part of a host of cultural practices created and established by disabled people to hack the lack of accessibility in our day-to-day -day encounters. And it plays a distinct role in establishing new ways of configuring the social world we live in, one that desires disability differently. And this desire is what I wanna to discuss today. The practice I described as part of just this nebulous network of relationships that we call disability culture. It's an invitation to dismantle the myth that disability is something isolated only to our bodies. Um, and this myth wasn't dispelled for me until meeting other disabled artists that really introduced me to this idea. It helped me understand that disability has a culture that is world building on the terms of disabled people when normality pervasively tells us we have no right to exist. Disability culture is about access, but it's also about questioning what this access gives us uh, accessibility to. Instead of thinking about this as just a legal or compliance or logistical issue, uh, disability culture asks us to understand access as love, as an act of hospitality, and as something that is relational and even cultural. And this isn't my idea. It comes from numerous disability justice activists and here, Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, and Sandy Ho, who are all part of the disability justice movement, has really uh, given title to this idea of access as love. Disability culture is about building a framework around the kinds of relationships we want to have and how to build the foundation of a society that orients towards disability justice rather than just disability from a rights-based model. And art plays a huge role in enacting disability culture through its world building potential. As queer theorist Esteban Jose Muno has said about queerness, it can exist as long as heteronormativity is the norm. 
that will always be moving towards this queer horizon and never fully attain it. So I think through disability arts, we disabled artists resist ableism and gesture towards our own horizon, a crip horizon, through which we move towards the warm glow of an elsewhere and elsewhen in which disability is not just tolerated, but imagined. And I'd like, just like to highlight one particularly particular strategy employed by disabled artists and curators termed creative access, which is a phrase coined by disability arts curator Amanda Kuchia. Creative access entwines access and art as a singular site of site meaning making. It's a conceptual framework for understanding access as a site of aesthetic potential with a robust and artistic experience rather than something just referencing this rigid checkbox of best practices. What happens when an artist takes charge of their own descriptive narrative for a video work or incorporates vibrotactile haptics translating the sound of their art pieces? These access practices are no longer just add-ons, but important sensorial entry points into an art piece. And I often think that if every artist could take a cue from the disability arts community and think about meaningful access in their work, it would help us to understand access as a vital part of our cultural aesthetic. It also means that access has this potential to be experimental and ruly and messy, but I think that's what we need to embrace difference and challenge what is considered normal on every front. As Mia Minga says in her essay, Changing the Framework, we don't want to simply join the ranks of the privileged. We want to dismantle those ranks and the systems that maintain them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alison Tedford, a business consultant and author and member of Kwakutl First Nation. I was born Allison Seaweed. We survived because of our good humor. At Sweat Adavera, an elder in my community and an auntie of mine said, lifting our spirits on a particularly sad day. We gathered in the aftermath of the confirmation of the mass graves of the children who attended Kamloops Residential School. We gathered to learn our language over Zoom in the middle of a pandemic, amidst grief unfolding in the headlines and in our communities. The aunties who were there to teach us sang us, you are my sunshine in Kwakwala, and we laughed and we cried and we prayed. That scene, all of us learning our language together, singing and dancing, that was not what was supposed to happen according to the architects of the residential school system. They wanted to get rid of the Indian problem, to kill our language, arts and culture until we were the same as everyone else. They tried to break our way of life, but they didn't succeed. Our cultures are resilient. The strength and beauty of my culture inspires me. I come from people who preserved and passed on a way of life, despite the threat of legal sanctions, despite the impacts of residential schools, despite a colonial government who did everything possible to stifle that which made us unique. We were and are resilient. Resilience is prized, but it is also weaponized. It's featured prominently in residential school denialism. So many times I've heard the stories of survivors who've struggled with trauma, denied or discredited because the wounds they carry are attributed to a lack of personal resilience rather than to the atrocities that they endured. The winding nature of their journey to healing is used to say no injury took place because who can believe someone who has struggled with substances or who has not had reliable employment, a stable residence, or is not as connected to their community as one would hope. The symptoms of the condition of colonization are used to point at a different disease, personal failing. In that way, the expectation of superhuman resilience is weaponized against the individual. There's a perverse need to have a perfect victim in order to believe. Who's to say how much a person should be able to endure and why should we demand that? The truth is messy and difficult and hard to carry, but that doesn't mean we should cast off the responsibility of learning the truth of what has taken place. Resilience is weaponized against the individual, but it's also weaponized against communities. The common traumatic experience of residential schools was designed to systemically extinguish the language, arts, and culture of indigenous people. It was a tool of assimilation and it did interrupt transmission. It did get in the way and it did separate people 
from the traditional ways of their communities, but we are still here. The fact that our languages, cultures, and communities continue to thrive, the fact that Indigenous people continue to exist is not evidence that it wasn't that bad, and it's a sign that we should just get over it. The strength of our communal armor does not mean the blade wielded against it was not sharp. Our resilience should not be held as evidence that the crime was not severe. I hear a conservative politician asking why flags were at half mass so long, and I have to tell you that if you think that's a long time for a flag to fly so low, I have some bad news about how long the residential school system was allowed to continue. Because the truth is, it was far too long, and we did lose people, many people who should have grown up to be elders sharing our way of life, and their remains are being recovered after so many years of being hidden. A strong, resilient people are mourning the loss of their little ones, and the fact that we're still here to mourn does not mean that what happened wasn't tragic. We are resilient so we can sing and dance and pray together. We are resilient so we can gather and learn our language from afar, and we can defy the expectations of those who hot, sought to harm us generations ago. Just because we are still standing doesn't mean it didn't hurt. We survived because of our good humor. Our ability to laugh now does not mean we do not have reason to cry. Our resilience is what gives us hope, reasons to hope for the future, but it shouldn't be used to deny our past. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Roberta Timothy. I give thanks and honor to the ancestors and indigenous peoples of this land, Turtle Island, where I live, and I give thanks and honor to my ancestors and the indigenous peoples for whose shoulders I stand on. I'm an African transnational indigenous woman Black feminists, womanists of West African ancestry. My language, tribe, land, name, and family have been taken away from me through over 400 years of colonization, anti-Black racism, massage noir, and other forms of intersectional violence. I'm surviving African enslavement through processes of forced migration. My peoples were incarcerated in the Caribbean, Latin America, and North America. And as such, I'm intrinsically linked to indigenous peoples and their struggles for self-determination, reparations and justice. As a result of this structural violence and what I call health violence, racism and brutality, I come from a working class background and I'm always considered a daughter of immigrants. I'm a mother of two living and resisting with a visual disability in Turtle Island, Canada. I'm an educator, researcher, community organizer and therapist with over 25 years of intersectional anti-oppression, anti-colonial praxis experience. I've been often told that I'm very resilient in fact, resiliency has been used to define how much what I call purpose, purposefully marginalized communities have survived adversity. Anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, massage noir, heterosexism, transphobia, classism, ageism, among other forms of intersectional violence that so-called marginalized peoples experience have been recently equated and connected to resiliency. Studies, research, Theories, funding calls, methodologies, and community practitioners are increasingly examining resiliency as a strength-based approach. I've been told that I'm so amazing, that I've survived so much, wow, that I've overcome so much barriers to be where, you are, where I am today, that I'm a real overachiever. In fact, I've been asked on several occasions to speak about how I overcame, even sometimes being asked to be positive about the not so good realities of living in an anti-Black racist world. Don't get me wrong, recognizing that I and my communities have moved through many traumas and dramas is an okay beginning, but it never can be the end result. The reality is that for oppressed peoples, quote unquote overcoming never ends. And resiliency is 365 days a year, 24 hours every day for a lifetime. That is usually cut short through physical, spiritual, and mental breakdowns based on critical determinants of health, such as racism, colonization, and intersectional violence. In other words, in other words, resiliency is about measuring or assessing how much stuff or oppression or hardship can you take and how you survive it or cope with it, rather than challenging or dismantling the structural violence that creates the need to be resilient. Hence, resiliency is still a tool of the state sanctioning individuals to quote unquote stories of success, unimaginable strength, 
superhuman subhuman perseverance without collectively dismantling systems of unequal power, white supremacy, and unearned privileges. Example or IE without demanding and fostering real social justice and change. Resistance and decolonization are better suited when discussing communities that face daily and historical challenge to living as they speak to actively changing structural violence in the lives of oppressed and colonized peoples. For black communities, resistance is a way of being. It's a teaching that not only helps us to survive intersectional daily acts of violence, but helps us actively fight against systems and practices that are anti-black racist and intersectionally violent. Resiliency can't stop the experience of anti-black violence in our schools, at the grocery, healthcare facilities, policing, parks, and most places. Resiliency asks us to cope with the violence and how we are impacted by it, but not to challenge it and destroy it. Resistance is connected to over 400 years of challenging colonial, colonial violence on the lives of Black, Indigenous, and purposefully marginalized peoples and our communities. Resistance is a rite of passage and allows for more than survival, looking for th thrival types of existence that are needed to dismantle violence. Decolonization, decolonization means literally dismantling systems that have historically and currently violated our peoples. Decolonization is about not only reimagining systems of equity, but creating them, utilizing transnational indigenous ways of knowing and recentering the lives of people who have been colonized. Decolonization is an act of resistance and it is life and death for peoples who have been surviving colonization for hundreds of years. Decolonizing, uh, colonization is not about just us economic superiority sanctioned by white supremacy practices, but rather true social justice implementation practices that embody actively taking apart structures that violate. Decolonization is being accountable for your unearned privileges, cohorts power and gains from white supremacy and colonization here and now and into the future. Resistance on the manifestations of emancipatory practice of the oppressed have been framed as interference, non-compliant, overt or covert opposition, all very important strategies to create anti-colonial praxis for surviving and dismantling colonial intersectional violence. Reimagining resiliency means actualizing collective resistance, decolonization for sustainable anti-violence change. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anne Spice. I'm Plinkett, a member of Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at X University. If I was going to put a name to this talk, I might call it Against Resilience. Indigenous peoples are often labeled resilient. As Canada turns from official policies of Indigenous assimilation and elimination to what Indigenous scholars have termed the politics of recognition, we are becoming accustomed to celebrations of our survival. But having our resilience noted without describing the context in which that resilience became necessary feels wrong. It feels like getting tripped, falling face first into the pavement, dragging ourselves back up, scraped and bloody, gravel and dirt ground into our wounds, only to have the person who tripped us in the first place say, wow, you got up fast and you look great. Instead of asking how we are, instead of asking how they can help, instead of being accountable for fall, causing us to fall in the first place. The truth is we are being tripped up again and again by the same forces. The colonizers continue to tear us from our territories. Capitalism continues to render our lives and lands into resources to be extracted. Over hundreds of years, we have been forced into barely livable conditions. We have been killed and removed, relocated and re-educated. We have been poisoned and abused and silenced. What has remained constant over all this time is not some immutable character of Indigenous resilience, some collective racial character that has allowed us to curl up and weather the storm, to get back up once we've been pushed down. The constant variable in all of this has been racial capitalism and its violent extractive practice. This colonial system is resilient because it feeds on our bones. This is a resilience that requires black and indigenous death to turn a profit. This is a resilience that animates the global economy with fossil fuels, even when this is a surefire path to our collective destruction. A resilience beyond science or ethics or fact. This is a resilience to be feared 
and to be fiercely rejected. And we do reject it. The survival of Indigenous peoples is not due to our ability to remain stoic or static. Our survival was not, is not a passive part of our character. We fought back against threats to our people. We analyzed and theorized and built strategies to confront the colonizers and their destructive ways. Even before conquest, we have stories of fighting monstrous beings that threatened our communities. And now we are not holding our breath for recognition of our resilience, especially if that recognition is a celebration that we didn't die in murderous conditions. We are tired of receiving compliments from people who are simultaneously trying to destroy us. The stakes of this fight are clear as governments around the world create strategic plans to deal with the worsening effects of climate change. Canada's plan is based on strategies of adaptation and mitigation as the country tries to balance adjusting to a change in climate with reducing the worst climate effects. Indigenous resilience is cast as part of the solution with a separate report on Indigenous resilience set to be released in 2022. But it's worth noting what other systems the language of resilience clings to. Canada's climate change strategies are full of talk of resilient economies, resilient infrastructure, resilient cities. And I'd be willing to bet that when it comes down to it, the resilience of the capitalist economy will win out as Canada's national priority. And when that resilience threatens our collective survival, we must turn our own collective resilience to re resistance and relation and revolution instead. There is a monstrous being to be fought and we can't hold back now just because he keeps feeding us compliments. Pinashish, thank you. Thank you, Anne. We just heard from live Sean Lee, Alison Tedford, Dr. Roberta K. Timothy, and just now Anne Spice. And prompted by Sean's talk, I'll add that I'm a white woman with shoulder length dark red hair. I'm sitting in my living room and I'm reflecting on access as well as the trap of resilience. Lots to think about and we're excited to open up this conversation. We have audience members joining us tonight, registered from all over. So a shout out, Vancouver, Iqaluit, uh, Pueblo Libre, Peru, Perth, Australia, Tokyo, Japan, uh, Queens in New York City. Thank you all for joining us from all over. Uh, and we invite you to share this conversation on social media. Take a picture of how and where you're watching us and feel free to uh, tweet quotes uh, or your reflections. Uh, just tag us at the walrus on social media and you can use the hashtag, hashtag walrus talks. I'd now like to invite my co-moderator for this evening to join me on screen. She's a former producer for CBC Radio, an independent writer and researcher on multiculturalism, disability and equity. Shafali Sojani, how are you? So glad you can be a part of this. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful evening, and I want to thank the Walrus for the opportunity to uh, uh, moderate this conversation, especially after hearing such thoughtful and engaging, indeed, I would say fierce uh, talks uh, from our speakers. Thank you again to Roberta, Allison, Sean, and Anne. And again, following Sean, my name is Shefali. I am a brown skinned uh, woman with short, mostly white hair. Um, and I'm wearing a blue dress shirt sitting in my uh, dining room. Um, I'm also partially blind. And um, so Jennifer will be helping us by reading the questions as they show up in the Zoom chat box. I have many questions and I'm sure that our audience members likely do as well. We're gonna start the Q&A session. To submit a question, you can text it, you can ask it in the Zoom chat box. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, our speakers to talk to, to join us on camera now as we um, uh, wait for those questions to come in and um, I'll try and get us started. Welcome back everyone. Hi. So let me, um, uh, sort of summarize a little bit what I, a few, a few points that I picked out from the presentation so far. I felt like one of uh, a, a takeaway for me from everything that uh, you folks said was that instead of 
thinking just about resilience, which is important to us as communities and individuals in how we survive in, in difficult circumstances, it's almost as if resistance is actually more important in this context. Um, and so I'd like to maybe go around a little bit to ask you about some of the strategies of resistance and um, goals of resistance that are really important. And I'm thinking particularly if I could start with Anne and Alison maybe, um, reflecting on yesterday's conversation where our prime minister finally made it to the Tecumlips community and apologized again um, and was received very graciously by the elders in that community. Um, but was told over and over again that what was needed was action, what was needed was a nation to nation relationship, um, and was reminded about the importance of land and sovereignty. So I wonder, Anne, if you could start with reflecting on that in terms of resistance and how resilience can be converted into resistance. I think that there's there's something to be said about making sure that we're speaking about the present as well as the past. And I think this is something that has definitely come into play uh, with the prime minister um, and the the performances, to be honest, in a lot of time a lot of times of of grief and um, the way that that gets addressed in the present the present time. Uh, as, as Allison mentioned, our communities are grieving. This is this is a difficult time, and um, part of that is because we're we're grieving the the effects uh, of this loss in the present, and we're grieving the fact that when these children were lost, and when they were in in these residential schools, and when they were pulled from their families, that at that time, it wasn't seen as grievable, and so uh, I think that. For me, transitioning to, to resistance to, is really about thinking, um, thinking carefully about what it is we're surviving. Um, why is there a requirement to be resilient? Um, what's after us? And, and then we have to you know, sometimes fight back, uh, you know, quite literally, um, because these, these uh, invasions are still happening. We're still finding our, our land taken from us or contaminated. Um, children are still being taken from their homes into the into the foster care system. Um, you know, the, these are attacks that are continuing. And so I think, uh, you know, it's a convenient tactic to place this in the past and then uh, call it a tragedy. But uh, this is these are factors that are still happening um, and are still really affecting Indigenous lives in, in the present. Um, and uh, that's not only grievable in this moment, it, it's, it's actionable. Um, we can stop that from happening uh, if, if we're doing that with the support of others as well. Um, and I think that the flip side of that is to, to make sure that we're not attacking and criminalizing people who are making who are doing those actions. That means the land defenders who are out there making sure that more land isn't taken or contaminated. Um, we can't be putting those people in jail. Uh, we should be having a, an abolition mindset about this. So. Um, yeah, I think that uh, you're, you're absolutely right that the, the hinge to, to resistance is, is really necessary. And I think that's also about the way that we pull those, those issues that are, are getting cast as, as parts of the colonial past into, into the present. Alison, could you comment on that too? Because one of the things I was struck in your uh, presentation was the importance of singing and joy and keeping that present and active in the way that you do your resistance. And again, thinking about yesterday's presentations, I was really struck by the importance of ceremony in Indigenous community and Indigenous practice. Could you talk about how that fits into resistance? Um, for sure, yeah. I mean, I, I come from family that resisted the potlatch ban for you know 75 years. The work of my great-great-grandfather, a lot of it was illegal to possess, um, and he still um, made masks for ceremony, and he is acknowledged to be, to have been a force in, in preserving and continuing um, that culture, and I think uh, part of our resistance is, is continuing to practice these things and continuing to live, and that these are not just traditions, and they're not historical artifacts, their ways of living and being and relating that are present now. And I think that it's also 
where apologies are extended, accepting, but also acknowledging that this isn't new information that these things happened. And, you know, there was an entire report about it years ago and nothing happened. So yes, be sad for what has happened and yes, be sorry, but tell me why you didn't do anything about it. And I think that's really what needs to be said is that we need to be able to have this dialogue and we need to have those difficult conversations about how we move forward in the face of that lack of action and how action will look moving forward. One of the things that you mentioned, Alison, which also resonated with me as a person with a disability, was this idea that these systemic um, oppressions and violence of colonialism uh, was converted through the language of resist uh, resilience into something about the personal failing of the person who did who was not resilient, right? And I think Sean, perhaps you can jump in at this point, speaking from a disability perspective, the way that disability is always personalized on the individual, that resonates very strongly for me. And I wonder if you could comment on that, as well as the way you talked about the practice of access a little bit more. Yeah, of course. I mean, growing up as a visibly disabled person, um, it was always, you know, taught to me that disability was something located only in myself. And it wasn't until coming into disability culture that I began to understand the social ways that disability is created. And I look to uh, leaders in the disability justice movement, like Talila T.L. Lewis, who gives us a definition of ableism that I've always uh, really turned to when, I, when I'm thinking about the ways that disability is a construction. And Talila, if I can recall this, says that ableism is a system that places value on each of our bodies and our minds around this idea of what is normal and um, what is valuable, you know, intelligence, excellence, productivity, those are the things that society values and, and disability is the antithesis to that. And so, ableism is a form of systemic oppression and it's something that often doesn't get acknowledged through that lens of self-determination and so you don't have to be disabled even to experience ableism ableism is a part of the structure that maintains um you know all the ways that we understand oppression and so i think for, for me, when we're talking about this idea of resilience, I think what you said, we are actually talking about resistance and disabled folks can teach us a lot about the way our society is constructed through disability culture, through imagining disability, not as something to be eliminated or cured, but actually uh, something with a place in our futures, something along that crip horizon that actually suggests disability is a difference that we can desire. I'm gonna jump in with an audience question. Uh, this is from Celeste. Really appreciate and resonated with what you shared, Dr. Timothy. What are the long-term changes and shifts in Canadian society you hope to see as a result of the new curriculum you're developing for the upcoming MPH in Black Health? Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, um, folks for the conversation. I, I think that I, I just wanted to add that the notion that colonization is post is a problem. We are currently uh, living and surviving uh, in a colonized system which violates uh, Indigenous uh, folks uh, in Canada and globally as an African Indigenous person and in my, my experiences. My name Timothy comes from a history of colonization, right? The fact that I speak English as my language and don't speak my Indigenous language comes from a history of colonization. Uh, so back to the question, which I think I'll relate uh, to the MPH and Black health. Um, no, number one, that there's always these, these pieces about, you know, curriculum. And when we ask about, you know, um, adding in, in curriculum on Black health, particularly, and also Indigenous health, there's always a, a, a piece of how do we do it? We don't know how to do it. Well, in a Eurocentric white supremacist system, of course you don't know how to do it because that would be 
you know, a, a way that the system would be dismantling itself. So I'm very, very aware of the, the educational system and what it does and, and the violence that uh, you know, I've experienced and many of us, I'm sure, on this call and in this, you know, who are going to be listening to this have experienced. The MPH in Black Health hopes to bring curriculum to talk about global Black Indigenous health. And um, what that means is that providing programs are not only on the impact of anti-Black racism, but also on our African spiritualities and wellness systems of health that are not uh, being represented in you know, the Canadian colonial system. I come from three generations of African spiritual practitioners uh, who were banned um, in, you know, in colonized places and spaces based on bringing African traditional spirituality to, um, to our community. So, you know, doing um, health, challenging uh, the health curriculum by actually including an anti-colonial black feminist lens, intersectional lens to um, public health is what this program hopes to do. Uh, and it's doing so in a system that is colonized. So therefore there are limitations, but resistance as we always have been taught is something that we're gonna continuously do to dismantle not only systems, but also um, dismantle ideologies and practices like in your brain consciousness, right? Um, decolonizing, dealing with internalized white supremacy or internalized anti-Black racism um, is really a critical piece to the healing and well-being of our communities. Thank you. Can I ask you to comment a little bit more directly on your personal experience of this word resilience? I know we're talking about it today, but I'm wondering, uh, anybody can jump in. Is there a moment when you sort of heard it and you went like, I'm going to blow a marble my at the top of my brain if I have to hear that word one more time? Anybody? Um, I guess I would say in the context of the pandemic, it has been really challenging. I mean, I speak from an indigenous perspective, but also from a disability perspective. And my condition is exacerbated by stress and these have not been calm times. And, you know, having to focus on, you know, the resilience to get through. And it's kind of like, I am tired of being resilient. I would like to be done and like skip to the end because it's, it's, objectively too much some days and it's 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 not comforting to feel resilient i just want to rest anybody else i think that uh the word does make me cringe and say some other words that i can't say on film um <laughs> but um yeah, resiliency is something that I think it's, it, I, you know, the weaponization I think that was used um, today in terms of the conversation, it's something that, you know, also if we as uh, folks who are surviving trauma and, and drama and, and colonized um, violence, when we say that, you know, we um, have had enough or that we're grieving or we don't want to have to deal, then there's that kind of the old, um, you know, racist stereotypes of who our communities are come up. We're not working hard enough, you know. We complain a lot. We are the angry black woman for myself and other folks, um, lazy, etc. So, you know, resiliency to me is really a. It's not only just problematic; it's violent, and it it needs to be not used um, in the work that we're doing because I think it doesn't add to the revolutionary practices that we have, our ancestors, our you know, our childrens, our children's childrens have at us that we're we're engaging with. So, I actually think it's. It's an act of violence, uh, the way it's used, particularly uh, as it maintains a, a, a system or a state that continuously um, acts on colonial violence. Sean, can you talk about how you react to that word and the ways in which some of the creative approaches of disability arts uh, are, are, are deployed to kind of convert Really, I think that what we're talking about here is to, to not re be required to talk about resilience, but to actually talk about how tired we are of having to endure. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, the word resilient immediately also recalled the word inspirational to me <laughs> as a disabled person and the way inspiration porn is kind of um, employed in a similar way as, as absolving, you know, systemic structures and barriers for disabled folks. And I think creative access and you know disability culture more generally really works to question the, the, a world that makes inaccessibility possible. 
And I think too, uh, one of the artists that we recently exhibited, um, Gloria Swain, who as an aging mad black woman, uh, curated artists as part of the show around black artists with hidden disabilities. And one of the artists wasn't able to be a part of our show. And rather than just kind of, you know, replace the artists, Gloria held an empty wall with, um, with a piece of text about how to hold space for not just this artist, but artists who um, can't fit into the arts system just because of the barriers, the speed, the pace, the, the, the need for output that is so prevalent in our art world. And I think, you know, as, as, as uh, Dr. Roberto Timothy, as Alison was saying, as Alison Tedford was saying, you know, we need to, we need rest and we need to question these systems that we are participating in. Anne, did you want to comment on anything? I just, just note that part of what is distressing about the language of resilience is that it, it continuously refers our value as Indigenous peoples back to the colonial system. And I think it's really important to find ways of valuing us and valuing our cultures that, that don't reference um, colonization because we held value before conquest, you know, and, and, and through. Um, and so the fact that we've survived that, uh, you know, I think that was part of what I'm trying to get to in the, in the talk is that, um, you know, that, that ability to survive is, is, is not passive and it, it's, it's worth looking at the, the ways in which we're resisting. But I think it's, it's worth going a step beyond even that because um, even resistance like talks about what we're up against. I think that um, we also need to be thinking about uh, how we hold value without, without reference to these systems at all. Um, and to do that with other communities that are also facing this, this form of more marginalization and to see that and recognize it in each other. Um, that we can recognize each other and, and um, show solidarity and really show up for each other without having to, to turn to the system at all. Um, and so I think there's a, a refusal there that I try to practice around um, where our value stems from as Indigenous people. Can we talk about that a little bit then? If we're going to say that um, we want to try to imagine, to borrow Sean's word, if we want to try to imagine different ways of being, different ways of relating, what are some of the values or um, practices um, that we would like to see? Like Sean has mentioned, for example, this idea of leaving the blank wall and finding space for the person who can't be there. Are there some other things that, you know, um, you would like to see that could be, that you can imagine that could happen, you know, outside of or somehow, uh, you know, in, in a separate way without reference to these other structures. Is that for me, Shafali? <laughs> sure, anyone, anyone, jump in, jump in and feel free to, to speak to each other as well. I mean, I think that there's there's been a lot of kind of colonial tricks around how this system can recognize us and, uh, without changing anything. Um, and I mean, the, the land acknowledgement it has become one of those where institutions that are built on stolen land, um, you know, sometimes having used enslaved labor uh, to, to build up their very foundations, then I make these acknowledgements of, of past harm. And so I think that we need to be moving past that to think about relationship. And so where the action stems from for me is thinking about um, how it can be in better relation uh, with groups who, um, you know, when I think about how my actions might be affecting someone, else ex someone else's existence and, and possible survival. And so I think it's about thinking really carefully about how I might be a good relative um, to these other, uh, other groups that are experiencing oppression. And I think everyone should be asking that. Um, and then beyond acknowledgement, uh, it's also about the, the protocols uh, for living on other people's territories. Um, you know, I, I ask people instead of, uh, you know, doing acknowledgements to, to think about uh, what gifts they've brought um, if they are, are coming to, to as guests to someone's territory. Um, it's worth asking, have you been invited? Um, and if you haven't, then like, where's that relationship gone? Have you worked to try and build a relationship that might in the future, you know, bring about an invitation? 
Um, so how can you make your presence less violent in these spaces? And I think it begins with having those conversations and building those relationships. Um, and you can't do a an, an land acknowledgement without actually having being in, in conversation and relationship with the, the Indigenous peoples whose land that is. The words aren't enough. Roberta, how would you like to imagine things operating differently? I think, um, well, I like what Anne said. <laughs> And I, I mean, I think solidarity movements am, among people of oppressed are critical because the divide and conquer that happens um, as an act of colonial violence, when we when we think that our movements are our owns and, and we stay in our little places and spaces, we see that there we continue to to live under colonial um, restraints. And there's a, a long history of Indigenous peoples globally really um, supporting each other, right, in terms of how, how I, I can tell you in terms of African folks surviving enslavement that had to do with Indigenous peoples from the lands that when we were taken and brought, um, you know, stolen away from, from the continent of Africa particularly. So uh, for me, solidarity is really important. I really challenge the notion of kind of this of allyship without action and solidarity, which leads to um, not only having, you know, um, feelings for folks, but actually stepping up, like, what are you doing? What are your actions? What are you giving back? What are you giving away? Because a part of reparations and, um, you know, reconciliation is also about giving back what's not yours. So, um, you know, uh, I, I was having a conversation earlier with folks, and it's like, if we really want to make changes within a system that is colonial, um, then why are we not um, why is Indigenous curriculum not the center, be centered in all of our educational systems? Why are we not speaking Indigenous languages? Why are we not, um, you know, having having conversations in ways that actually will make change? So to me, that's a piece of what I would do. Um, also, I, I I think that the you know African Indigenous ways of knowing um, and wellness um, are important to understand. They're important to share. We have we bring laughter. We bring enough jokes we bring creativity and the arts and we do things in a different way like we you know how we live and i'm really um uh, thinking that we need to creatively look at outside of the boxes we've been put in to do this resistance centered work well on that i'll, I'll jump in with an audience comment and our, our final question here as we're coming to the end of our hour together this is from greg who adds in chat the depiction of non-white joy is missing from popular culture and Greg references an episode of Small Acts that broke through this showing Black celebration. Um, and you just mentioned this, Roberta, about jokes and Allison in your talk as well. Uh, for each of you, as well as you, Shea Folly, what's bringing you joy, especially in the, the pandemic? Where are you finding it? Sean, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'm thinking there's so many. There's so many things, um, but I, I think one thing that's really bringing me joy right now is seeing crip interdependence, you know, leaning on one another and coming together as a community digitally. Um, I think that's something that we haven't been allowed to do as much. Um, and the pandemic has sort of set a different term of working. And so I've been able to collaborate and meet with um, a host of other disabled folks, uh, which has been really, really great, really joyous, and and just being able to lean on one another um, for support in these times has been very powerful. Allison, um, I've really been enjoying uh, time with my son, who's thirteen, and also getting to do more speaking because, I mean, uh, as someone with a disability and I have a lot of discomfort traveling. It takes a lot out of me. I'm able to do so much more speaking and engaging with people where it would be really hard on me if I had to actually go in person. So I'm getting to bridge that geography and the um, limits of what how many spoons I have to, to engage. And also getting to have some really amazing conversations. This year has been a great year for getting to connect with some really incredible people. Um, present company included. So I'm grateful for that. Maybe I'll ask the other two speakers before I wrap it up then. Jennifer, is that okay? Anne and, Re and Roberta? Well, I, I've been finding a lot of joy in growing things. And uh, I think seeing people get back to their gardens 
and really um, we think about sustainability and um, you know food sovereignty in a different way uh, throughout the pandemic. That's uh, been a source of joy and also um, gives me hope for how people might approach this whole system in a different way. For me, I think I found joy, continue to find joy in a lot of um, conversations with ancestors, conversations with my kids and being on the land um, and trying to create like one pot dishes because we, you know, we're, we're working and doing school online on home, home online school at the same time. And just appreciating the fact that we're able to have these conversations is also part of joy and hope um, for the next generations and, and our generations also. Thank you. And I'll throw in um, so many of the things people have talked about. And just this past weekend, my mom and dad celebrated their 59th anniversary. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and they're both safe and healthy, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it made me very happy to go and be with them this past weekend. So, and, and this has been amazing. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Shefali, do you want to say any final words? Otherwise, I'll start kind of wrapping things up. No, I think I, I just want to thank everybody. And um, maybe I'll just add, you know, I think the pandemic has been so interesting in that, you know, as, as anyone who is working in disability uh, will know, as Allison has mentioned, all of a sudden, all these things that had to be done in person, we can do them online. So woohoo! <laughs> hopefully we'll keep that going forward. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Shefali, for moderating the conversation. And thanks to all of our talkers, lots to reflect on. And yeah, we're building a new world. We're in it and we do it every single day. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's event, there's more. A week today, next Tuesday, October 26, Facebook Canada has partnered with us to present the Walrus Toxic Home CanCon online. And this is about the new online creator economy. And then on Thursday, October 28th, we're partnering with Media Smarts to present the Walrus Toxic Home, our digital lives. And this is exploring how the pandemic has really changed the way we engage with digital media, actually just building on what we were talking about. Check in with us at thewalrus.ca slash events. You can see our schedule. You can register for events that you're interested in. Also, we take all the videos from our talks, including tonight, and we feature them in the Walrus Talks video room at our website. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. You're going to receive an email follow-up. And the best way to stay in touch with us is to opt in our newsletter so you won't miss a thing. At The Walrus, we believe that trustworthy journalism is an essential service. And with your support, we can continue to do what we do best. We have just launched our fall giving campaign. This is the time of year when we reach out to our community for support. So if you enjoyed this free event tonight, and you wish to share your support, please consider making a donation at thewalrus.ca slash donate. All gifts of $20 or more receive a charitable tax receipt. Thank you again to Farah Kurji and everyone at TD Bank Group for making this conversation possible, as well as our longstanding partnership together. Thank you as well to our annual sponsors. This is Air Canada, Facebook Canada, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, and Shaw. Community is so important in these COVID times, and each one of you is part of the walrus. Thank you for joining us, and until soon, we'll meet again. <laughs>